Hi, I'm Craig Dorr, Auth Lead for RSA Team ANZ, and today we are going to continue our web series on RSA's risk-based authentication in Auth Manager version 8. In this video, I'll demonstrate the architecture and overview of how risk-based authentication is implemented in your enterprise. I'll also go over the flow in terms of user authentication with risk-based so that you can see the value and benefits and ease of use. But first, I'm going to go over what I've drawn on the whiteboard here, just to give you a lay of the land of all the components in play. Of course, we would start with Authentication Manager, a primary and replica, sitting hopefully next to an identity source of some stripe, in this case, Active Directory. This obviously contains all your users, groups, and attributes, which will be utilized in context. I'd also like to call out an SMS provider. If your risk engine is going to be using SMS tokens or on-demand as a step-up method, an SMS provider is required. Between the red lines, we have this DMZ concept where all of our edge network and user-facing services exist. In this example, it's an SSL VPN. It can also be web applications and others. We also have the RSA web tier which is a component of the Risk Engine that comes with Auth Manager version 8. The web tier is an installable component onto a Windows or Red Hat server. It also contains optional components such as the self-service request console. It also contains a token server, which provisions and activates tokens out to end user devices. The first part of what I want to show you is basic secure ID authentication. This is just using a token, and I want to illustrate in context how it works. Typically, the user will start by visiting the edge network device like an SSL VPN. Inbuilt into most of these VPNs is an actual dedicated secure ID agent. This is produced by the manufacturer, and we partner with all sorts of vendors in order to help them instrument Secure ID in their products. If a dedicated Secure ID agent is unavailable, you fall back on RADIUS. And the good news is, is both RADIUS and Secure ID support risk-based authentication. And the idea here is that when a user comes into the VPN, they are prompted via policy to provide a token code. And that functionality is delivered through the Secure ID agent or RADIUS back to Auth Manager to validate. And that is essentially the, where the story ends. The user gets access or not and gains access to whatever resources are protected by the VPN, or in other cases, a web application. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about how risk-based authentication works. So as we've said, we have an integrated Secure ID agent ready to go inside of the SSL VPN. Usually this is defined within Auth Manager as what we call an agent host record. When you are using this solution with risk-based authentication, one aspect of this agent host record includes a small bit of JavaScript. And what we do is we install it into the SSL VPN. We provide the script and you install it. We are taking advantage of a natural piece of VPN or web technology which allows you to customize the login experience for your end users. So for example, if your policy dictates a resource is protected by RBA, it will launch a page that includes this JavaScript, which performs a certain function. And that function is a page onload event, which redirects the user's browser session over to the web tier. The web tier contains basically the conversation with the end user device. And then it also performs user level authentication based on their RSA password or Active Directory credentials. Think of the RSA web tier as a proxy into services that exist on the Auth Manager primary. As stated, once the redirection happens and we take over the conversation, we do a set of evaluations and we evaluate the user's device based on components of the user agent string in the web conversation. So essentially, we are peering in to this conversation and gaining attributes about it. 
We're also making notes of other things, including user behavior, whether they get their password correct or not, and other services. The idea being is that once we've done an evaluation of the user's device environment and user behavior, we actually feed that into the risk engine, which does an evaluation or assessment of the riskiness of what that person is doing. If all is well, what we'll do at that stage is return control back to the calling agent and say that they are authenticated. But on a deeper level, let me tell you that what we actually do is perform an another secure ID authentication, and this is how it works. When we evaluate the end user device, we take a whole set of collection of attributes from the device and the device environment. Things like screen resolution, pixel depth, browser version, browser extensions, operating system, operating system version, and patch level, etc., etc. So several dozen factors are taken into account. And what we do is we produce an actual cryptographic hash of all this information and put it together. When we return control back to the calling SSL VPN, we actually submit this hash as a two-factor authentication. If two-factor is considered something that you have, in this case, it's the device hash, and something that you know, which is the user password, this is actually two-factor authentication. But the user has only used his username and password. Everything else, in terms of what I've drawn here, is invisible. And the idea is that if all of these things balance and check, that means that the story continues and the user proceeds into whatever resources that he or she has access to. The next stage is when the user does something anomalous. So once we've actually fed and authenticated the user based on all of these factors, let's say that the user logs in at 9 a.m. from the same browser every single day. And then all of a sudden, the user is logging in at midnight from a totally different device environment. Well, what this will do is it might trigger the risk engine. And the risk engine will actually stop the processing of the user's authentication and challenge them. And what it does is it challenges them with a configured step-up method. Presupposing that the user is already has a pre-configured step-up method, typically an on-demand token, what happens is that the step-up will actually challenge this user in line and send an SMS message. And that SMS message goes out to an out-of-band device, which in most cases is a mobile phone. The SMS reads off the token code, and the user will enter that token code during authentication. If that is all good, then the user device is registered, the behavior is noted, and then again the user will continue through. And in this sense, the actual authentication is an initial hash based on their secure ID hash inside of the device environment. And then with step up, it's another two-factor authentication system. So that means that risk-based authentication, even in the worst case in this picture, is two-factor twice. Now let's add one more piece of the puzzle just for a bit of fun. Normally, when a user gets redirected from the VPN or web application into our web tier, they're challenged with an AD credential or an RSA password. But you can actually form this initial challenge with a token. So that means that the initial challenge is a token that may, may have already. And then we're doing this secure ID authentication with a hash. So you've got two-factor authentication twice in normal use case. And then third, if they were to step up to an on-demand token, that's a third layer. This elevates the security posture of risk-based authentication married to secure ID authentication. And you got there by not really actually having to do a lot of work. All you had to do was instrument the risk engine inside of Auth Manager, very easy thing to do, install the web tier, very easy thing to do, and install a little bit of JavaScript on your web application. And now let me just finish this little picture by pointing out to you something about security 
balance. From our perspective, good security e equals a set of managed controls. So in this case, I'm using tokens as controls. But another thing that we've done is instrument a measure of visibility as well. So if you think of your controls as inputs to Secure ID, a good output to Secure ID will be things like auditable events. And let's say, for example, you're using this situation to authenticate the CFO in logging in. Wouldn't it be nice to know if the, if the CFO user were logging in at midnight from a bizarre IP address from a bizarre device? It may be fine and the step up might actually work, but wouldn't it be nice to propagate this to other systems? With the risk engine, you get a visibility over the types of activities that happen during authentication such that auditable events include logging in at midnight from a new device. What that can be done is you can propagate this downstream to an external CM system. RSA provides one such CM system in what we call security analytics. Also syslog and also SNMP or all of them. And then another visibility component that we particularly like is also the built-in reporting engine. All of these capture auditable events in terms of events or users of interest in your environment. And that is a deeper understanding of how the risk engine works with Authentication Manager. Now you've seen the complete picture. If you look at our other videos in the channel, you'll see mechanisms around how to establish step-up challenge for a large mass of users, and you can also see other use cases for RBA and how that works. This concludes this video series on risk-based authentication. I hope you found it informative, and please come back for our next video. Thank you.